understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word. It is so wonderful that Father has written us this letter, sent us this little scroll that foretells us all things when you just take the time to um, absorb it, to understand it, and it is reality, not a religion. It's our Heavenly Father's instructions to us in this earth age. And knowing what He wants from us is the starter. He wants our love. And when you love Him, He fills in all the blanks Himself. If you trust Him, turn it over to Him. Do your best. Never quit. Chapter 4, verse 1, the great book of Ezekiel. Let's go with it. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. Now these were, they were in the captivity, so these are Babylonian tiles, about 14 by 12 inches, and when they're wet, still damp, you could draw on them, ride on them, and then bake them or sunbake them. And it became a, a writing plate then. What he's saying here, we're going to prepare a siege against Jerusalem, the city he loved, our father loved. When we get to the 16th chapter, you'll find where God made an eternal covenant with this geographical location that tells you a lot when you understand that particular portion. But he says, you draw this picture out. This is how it's going to go down. And you don't want to forget it either. Verse 2, and lay siege against it and build a fort against it. That, that's, you make a tower uh, and, um, and make your plans to be against it and cast... Um, a mount against it, set the camp also against it. Five times he's going to say against it. That's grace. It means for a good purpose, okay? And set badly, uh, battering rams against it round about. And so it was. That means we're, I'm going to shut it off. Verse 3, Moreover, take, the, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. Thou shalt be assigned to the house of Israel. This, rather, shall be assigned to the house of Israel. And, and it is assigned to you today if you understand it. First of all, you've got to know what kind of pan this is. Usually today, when we think of a pan, we think of a pan with sides on it. Well, th this is just a pan, a flat pan that you bake bread on. And you would stick that pan in and the bread would cook uh, the dough on it and it would bake. But it was a baker's pan, the, the title declaring therefore. But what comes from the bread pan? Bread. Who was the bread of life? Who would come to this city, Jerusalem, and pay a price that would bring salvation to the whole world if they would believe? And naturally, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. So you must insert this to understand the pan and what you put between you and the siege. You put Christ between you and the, the siege that baking pan which bakes the bread. And remember Amos chapter 8, verse 11. In the end times, that's this generation, the famine is not going to be for bread, but for hearing the word of God. That has been the subject in these first three chapters is teach the word of God. Teach my word. And that's what this is about. The bread of life, and it's important, you're not going to understand the rest of the teaching if you do not absorb that particular thought. Verse 4, and he continues, uh, 
Again, I want to emphasize this is a sign to the house of Israel, not the house of Judah. For lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. Now, this is how long they're going to be in sin, just going away from God, practically disowning him. Verse 5, For I have laid upon thee the years, not days, years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Now, I want you to remember Israel, the house of Israel, the ten northern tribes, went into captivity 200 years before the house of Judah. Thus, the difference in, in days here. Continuing, verse 6. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now, it's very important that you understand this. Do you remember the dates that I said that uh, Ezekiel's reign uh, transpired? It was from 484 to, four, to until 463. Very important that you know 463. Now, well, well, what possibly could that mean? Well, this is where the bread of life comes into it. The 390 years adding 40 to it is 430 years. 430 years, but what about the bread of life? When would that price be paid where Christ became that bread, his body? His body took the stripes, we received the healing. His body was crucified in A.D. 33. So there you've got another 33 years. So 430 years plus 33 years is exactly 463 years that the iniquity would be upon this city from the time that Ezekiel's ministry ended until Christ was crucified and the bread of life became a reality and a, and a block between us and any iniquity that might come along if you believe. Right to the day. So you can't go wrong on that. Our Father always foretells us all things. When you have eyes to see and ears to hear, how precious it is. I will go through that one more time in case uh, someone did not take note. Ezekiel's reign, his ministry, ended in 463 B.C. Okay. 4, 5, 463 B.C. That's 463 years before Christ. Now this takes into consideration the 110-year correction that you have in Jeremiah 24. Right in your companion Bibles. He was to lay upon his side for the house of Israel because they went in captivity 200 years before Judah, 390 days each for a year. And for the house of Judah on the side for 40 days, which was 40 years. So 40 and 390 is 430. And then to the time that that bread from the pan came from the oven, spiritually speaking, that is to say Christ paid the price, 33 years, you have exactly what God predicted would happen to the people, and then salvation would come to the world, whomsoever would. They would have that promise where God himself, Emmanuel, God with us, would pay that price. Uh, so God's word is so complete and so beautiful when you absorb it. Let's continue then with the next verse, please. Verse 7. Therefore thou shalt set thyself toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. In other words, all this time you're going to teach against it. I'm going to leave you one arm free so that you can teach, so that you can prophesy, so that you can give the word of God. 
verse 8. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. This is a design, a, a divine constraint. It's going to happen exactly that way. That's what God is saying. There, there, it's, that bondage is going to be there. That siege is going to take place. And then comes that beautiful, wonderful, divine release when the bread of life becomes a reality. Christ paid the price. He defeated death. Oh, grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? For he is the God of the living, and we live eternally. But that teaching, even though the captivity is going on, even though the siege is there, that one arm must be free to teach and prophesy with the word of God. That is to say, to repeat the prophets, whereby you know and understand what befalls you, especially in this generation, where that city again becomes the barometer of the world. Watch it. Verse 9. Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in one vessel <clears throat> and make thee bread thereof according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. Three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. Um, verse 10. And thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by weight uh, twenty shekels. Um, that's only 200 grams. That's not very much a day. From time to time shalt thou eat it. In other words, this is symbolic of starvation, practically. Sufficient. But, I mean, things are pinched. Eleven, thou shalt drink also water by measure. The sixth part of an hen, that's about one and a half pints, our measurement, from time to time shalt thou drink. In other words, things are going to be a little tight, but adequate. Do you know something? God will always take care of you. You will have what is adequate for you to accomplish what it is God would have you accomplish if you love him and if you are focused. If you're not focused, you, God can't really use you. I mean, you're wishy-washy. God only can use those people he can depend on. And we're in a generation where that becomes not just important, it is severely important. Verse 12. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes. And thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. That is an abomination. To, to, to do that in the sight of man, that would be an abomination. Do you, well, what, what do you do in a case like that? Well, you do exactly as Ezekiel did. Listen to it, verse 13. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. Now, this is the reason for the, um, the insufficient of health laws, because of their sin and what they do for them to themselves, that they are polluted with perversion and falling away from God's plan until there is filthy, diseased, uh, as it would be if you were to make the bread of men's dung as well as um, the, the very sin itself. That's the disgusting uh, part that God's children do to themselves. God doesn't like it. Verse 14. This is what Ezekiel did. Then said I, Ezekiel speaking, O Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted, for from my youth up, even till now, I have not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither come there abominable flesh into my mouth. I haven't touched it. And, and so it is. You'll remember, God did this same thing to Peter in Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius came to the gate, 
to signify that Gentiles that believed and loved the bread of life, that is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, could have eternal life also. <clears throat> but naturally, if, if you do, uh, God uh, appreciates the fact that Ezekiel would not pollute himself by obeying God's laws. So what does God do about it? Verse 15. Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. And so it is. You know, to many of us that lived on the plains of Texas uh, during the Depression and other times, we're used to using cow chips to cook with and to heat with in the wintertime. Uh, when they are dry, they burn and make good firewood because on the plains of Texas, there's not all that much wood to be had. So chips, uh, they make good firewood in, in preparing food. God answered his prayer. Okay. God does not expect you to pollute yourself ever. He was only signifying how that the house of Israel would contaminate itself with ungodly sins because of filth that they would perpetrate upon themselves. Verse 15, Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. Got that? Next verse 16, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem. And they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment. And again, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the end times, the famine is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God taught from Jerusalem. Um, the Breaking the bread of the staff, um, his body took the stripes and we get the healing. And this is a prelude to the salvation message. What it means is the people there are going to have a pretty rough time of it. Food, um, things are going to be scarce. There, there's uh, in limited, especially peace. And they cry, peace, 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 let us make peace. But you're not going to have any peace there, for there's only one, only one Prince of Peace, and until he comes, there will be no genuine peace in this world. Many people will talk about it. Many people will promise it. It will not be de facto until naturally the Prince of Peace uh, joins us. That's what this is about, is preparing you, knowing God knew long before time what was going to happen at Jerusalem. He said, you, you just take that tile and you set the siege. This is how it's going down. You know what it did right to the year. Our Father's in charge. Have you read the plan? This is it. Verse 17. That they may want bread and wash her and be a stone one with another and consume away for their iniquity. They're going to pine away, but most of all, they're going to be in a stupor, even when they look at each other, not really understanding what's going on. Hey, look at it today, my friend. The stupor is there. I mean, um, honest talks do not come forth. People, um, one side expects the other to give conditions that are impossible whereby the other side wants peace, but at the same time says, we're going to blow you off the map. I mean, that's not the way to get along. And Father knew it. He knew this would come to pass. So the Prince of Peace shall come, and there shall be peace. But man, with all his planning, and I could say stupor or I could say stupidity, in his stupidity, he'll never pull it off because they're not intelligent enough to. All they had to do was read this, read the scroll, understand the scroll. 
and know from Father's Word what tomorrow is going to bring anyway, regardless of what they think they're going to do. For it is written, and it shall come to pass exactly as it is written. Chapter 5, verse 1. And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard, and then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. Now, I, I want you to remember even in the first earth age, Satan drew away a third of God's children. They're divided in thirds. And all these things are a sign as to the house of Israel of what shall befall it, especially in the end generation. Verse 2, God always measures things out accurately. Verse 2, Thou shalt burn with fire a third in the midst of the city. When the days of the siege are fulfilled, and thou shalt take a third and smite about it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. I'm going to scatter them to the whole world. This is the children of Israel. Have you never read the New Testament in certain books that would say, well, is he, is he speaking to those that are dispersed, meaning scattered? God always keeps his promise. But always know this, much of the scattering was done for their own protection, whereby they would be free peoples in, in large part. But the water of life is the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the bread that is his body that takes the stripes and we get the healing, that's knowledge, wisdom, and understanding spiritually where you don't have some miserable, sick, spiritual soul that doesn't know whether the sun's coming up or going down. Absolutely lost in a stupor in this world that it gives you a solid foundation. It puts you on the rock. And that rock is none other than he that paid that price to begin with. Verse 3, Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. This is God's elect. There always has been that remnant. There will always be that elect that God chooses, that he sees, that will bring forth the real truth so that people that are meant to hear can hear. Those that have eyes to see can see and ears to hear can hear the true word of God. What saith the Lord God? Not what some man might say. What some, what some tradition of men might say. But what God himself says is that's how it's going to be. So you take care of those few. You keep them right close to you. You see, they're, they're not special. They earn the right, as it is written in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth. Why? They earned it. They stood against Satan then, and they're going to stand against him again. Verse 4, Then take of them again, and cast them into the midst of the fire, and burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth unto all the house of Israel. But always remember this. That fire also is a consuming fire. Do you know who the consuming fire is? Have you ever read the last verse of Hebrews chapter 12? God says, I am a consuming fire. The Holy Spirit, if you're evil, fries you, spiritually speaking. If you love him and are a Christian, it warms your heart. It gives you knowledge, shelter. It gives your soul food. And your soul isn't some miserable thing floating around in your head, not knowing what tomorrow brings, but grows strong with truth and knowledge from Almighty God. Next verse, please. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. 
And this is for a sign. The sieges will transpire. There's trouble there. Well, I didn't know there was going to be trouble. The Bible warns you about it over and over, the sieges of Jerusalem. This is why it is real easy to say the peace talks that are going right now, they're going to fall flat on their face. Well, well, how would you know that? Well, it's common sense. If you don't have all parties at the table, you're wasting your time. You've still got one element that says, we're going to blow you off the map. That's not peace talk, friend. That's war. Verse 6. But then, did not God say, siege after siege after siege? Here it comes. 6. And she hath changed my judgment. She rebelled against me into wickedness more than the nations and my statutes more than the countries that are around about her, for they have refused my judgments and my statutes. They have not walked in them, and neither do they try. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, A virgin shall conceive and bear a child. You shall call him Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. Jerusalem didn't accept that. How sad. How much better this world would have been if the Prince of Peace had been recognized. But then man is man, and the Prince of Peace is the Prince of Peace. Verse 7. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because, why? Because you multiplied more than the nations that are around about you and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are around about you. You, you are more wicked than all the rest of them put together. What can I count on from you? Wickedness, of course. Verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, that's emphatic, my friend, I, even I, am against thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And it's going to happen. Verse 9, And I will do in thee that which I have not done. And were and two, I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations. That's what's going to happen. Verse 10, Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter unto all the winds. Do you know what? Their heritage means nothing. Why are they scattered? They don't know who they are. Uh, the, the whole ten tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountains, if you ask 90% of them who they are, that's about, I'm a Gentile. When they're a member of the house of Israel, the Caucasians that went over the Caucasus Mountains, that being the reason they were called Caucasians, settling Europe and then later Canada and America, supposedly bringing forth the mission of Almighty God for the house of Israel. And they don't even know who they are scattered perhaps in a sense for their own protection, but, and building and trying to do that that is right by the very basic common sense instilled within them from birth, that God is the God of all creation, and he will remain so. Verse 11, Wherefore, as I live, you can count on this, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely, because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee. Neither shall mine eye spare, neither shall I have any pity. I, I, I'm going to work you over real good. You know, our Father gives us the message. Our Father gives us his plan, his purpose, he's good to us. He assures us that he loves us. Why? Well, in the scripture, the, the scroll he sent us, the love letter he sent to us. And most will not even take the time to read it and could care less, go about their putrid ways, 
of breaking every wish of the living God and then wonder why he doesn't bless them. I mean, stupor is not the proper word. Verse 12, a third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee, and I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. That's the knife that you beat that shaving with. That's the sword of the Lord. And the sword of the Lord cuts both ways. It can bruise or it can shape you up to be a living citizen of Almighty God. And whether you're scattered or not, if you hold the commandments of God, you are guaranteed His blessings. And in the ultimate end, God sent that small amount, that few, that have eyes to see and ears to hear. When most of the world is deceived and chase and whore after false teachings, the Antichrist, and fall into the pit of the end days, not even knowing who they are. What, what, a, what a sad state of affairs. This is why teaching the book of Ezekiel is such a blessing, because it lets you feel the emotions of God. You see, he didn't send an angel to say this. He came in that vehicle, highly polished bronze, that word amber in verse 4 of that chapter 1. It was an actual vehicle. His altar was aboard it. He came in person to deliver this so that you would know exactly how he felt without any excuse. Therefore, there is no excuse other than to understand God expects his children to love him and to obey him and receive his blessings. That isn't too much to ask. Do you know something? That's what every parent on this earth wishes, is simply for people to do well. Well, our Father wants them to do well, but many of them, it would seem, could care less. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?